good feedback from your uh, television, television radio performance from uh, Carl Patrick. Uh, yes, Dr. Patrick. Does he need a sign? I can get him a sign. No, let's see. I got it. I got it. He's got one. I think he's got it signed. Okay. Uh, I haven't one. been to Eastman. Said so you've done a job there. So oh, you've been a oh, hey, thank you all so much for coming up and for supporting um, just a civic connection opportunity for all of us. And what's really interesting about my campaign is I'm looking around this room and I've seen people of incredible diversity of thought and experience, which is not something you see in either the Republican or Democratic Party. So I really just want to praise the open-mindedness of people here in this room. One of the formative experiences of my life was um, coming back from the Iraq War and feeling like I was in an alien world of good people supporting something that, I should just say, going along with something that I really felt in their hearts they, they actually didn't. They were just swept in a wave. And I promised myself, I will never let the need for psychological comfort or the, the approval of a peer group determine what is right and wrong for me. And <coughs> that led into being uh, among the leadership of a anti-war veterans organization called Iraq, Iraq Veterans Against the War. That had conservatives, libertarians, communists, <laughs> Democrats, and Republicans. Of a, there was a diverse ideological range of people that found <coughs> common ground. And I was so at home there. Those were my tribe. <laughs> Those were people I, I would lay down in traffic for. So. Um, this is not a, a new feeling uh, to be in a room of, of diverse thought. I just want to say thank you all for being here. Thanks for coming down. So I am a new, newly politically active person, so sorry to cut in. So I'm glad Please you've do. taken the time, especially for such a small group. And I just want to let you know, like, I was pretty much going to set this election out. You know, I didn't see anybody top, down, anywhere on the ticket that I had any interest in it. Both parties are getting so extreme and just loony that I just I couldn't find myself interested or excited about any candidate. Um, as I dove more into your campaign over the past few weeks, I was like, you know, I could sit here and watch this crap from the sidelines or try to support somebody that I do believe uh, is willing to speak candidly without political answers. Um, and I'm glad to do it. Uh, I don't have any experience. Can't drive turnout. I don't have advanced email lists or thousands of dollars to spend. But I'm happy to help in the closing weeks here uh, and beyond. I'm politically adrift. I'm a free agent. <laughs> and no one's really reaching out. Um, so thank you for taking the time and for donating your time over the past few months to run this campaign. John, <coughs> ever not vote because that means you're just apathetic. If you put in one candidate's name and none of the others, you're making a statement. Mm -hmm. You mean to, to uh, write in? Uh, uh, Even if you write it in? Yes. yes. Anything to okay. show that you've gone to the polls. Okay. And to turn, to turn down all of the options that have been offered on the lines. The last person? You know, then you know that you're going to lose the election, but you need to send a message to the people who record the results that the choices that have been provided are not really the choices that would be available in a democracy. That's right. The last write-in I did was Teddy Roosevelt. They got a clue that I was a little dissatisfied. <laughs> <laughs> I will say I would have voted for Phil Scott and Joe Bennett. Those would have been my two, and I would have just called it even. But I'm actually for a uh, process where you can have a none of the above and that if there was enough enough none of the above votes on any excellent idea that it would it would be a redo of the election great idea yeah. so what do you think what do you think of the uh, change in the primary uh, situation to have I forget the name of it now we have no party primary but uh, you choose the, the, the ones who get the first and second 
Ranked choice. choice. Ranked choice. Yeah. Oh, ranked choice voting. Mm. Uh, right. I'm glad we just jumped right into this. So I think that I'm, I'm open to a lot of innovations to improve the health of the political system. That's one of them. But if you look at the th I just want to talk about the things we know won't work. Right? There's a, I don't, I'm not going to spend a lot of time just like hammering home the, this system is screwed up, blah, blah, blah. We all kind of get that there's a lot of dysfunction. Right? I won't belabor the point. Um, I'll belabor the point a little bit. Right? Like the, Joe Biden and Donald Trump being the options from the most powerful person on the planet is a wake up call. Right? Yes. And then you have the, the Democratic Party. We, we saw what they did with Bernie Sanders, right? They, they put their, their hands on the scale. If that's not upsetting to you, fine, I don't care. What's upsetting to me is this election cycle, the Democratic Party is funding um, the most fervent Trump candidates all across the country. And that should piss you off, even if you're a Republican that supports Trump. Like the idea that the Democratic Party is influencing who the representative of the Republican Party is should piss you off if you're a Republican. And it should sure as hell piss you off if you're a Democrat, that they're funding the most you know, radical worst options for democracy. Right? Like, those are some points of dysfunction. How are the Democrats helping they, the, They've the given Trump? millions of dollars in primaries to Republican candidates that were the... In an organized way? Or? Yeah. You mean the Democratic uh, Party yeah. has done Yes. And and by what mean? Well, the, 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 me, the media it's certainly not hasn't reported that. Di directly from the DNC or what? From, from, it's got to have been indirect. Uh, Please. Why are they doing that? Okay. Because this is quite they, an allegation. In their logic, no. Who have? How has been the money flow to the Republicans? I don't. I don't know the exact mechanics of it, but I've I've seen the reporting from even liberal sources like NB, uh, MSNBC, where their anchors are reporting this in outrage. Right? Like they they, hmm. they claim that it's the DNC doing this, and that oh my God. a uh, bastardization of democracy. Well, look what happened in New Hampshire, where they crossed lines in the primaries, and the Democrats all went uh, and uh, crossed the party line and got a Republican nominated. Like the worst one. Yes. Yeah. And uh, that's crossing party line is new in my life. Uh, everything's new mm. in my life. Mm. It's sabotage. It is. It's a I would think it's illegal, totally. No, no they it should be. It illegal. should be illegal, but it isn't. Because they're taking the public's money and, and well, making it's not, choices. It's not, it's, not the public's money. Money. it's not the public's money. It's but it's deceiving the public. Oh, it it's isn't? Well, Democratic Party. Well, I would just call well, it poisoning the, from the people. Yes. Poisoning the well of options, right? Oh, not from taxpayers. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, so those, that, that's how I'll belabor the point. So we have a pretty dysfunctional system, and I want to get to what won't work. <laughs> we hear a lot of for generations now, surface level thinking about what would fix the dysfunction. One is better candidates. And that's not to say that we shouldn't ask for better candidates, and that's not important. But the idea of changing players over and over and not changing the rules of the games, you could send nuns and monks into a brothel and a bar, and like you're not going to get the results that you want. They're going to the rotten system will affect their behavior. Right? Just changing the people. I don't need to argue it more than just saying, well, look at the results we've got. Like the, the dysfunction continues, and the strategy of change the players, change the players, change the players doesn't really get us far in changing the health of the system. So I want to dispense with the idea of changing the candidates alone is what will save the day. The next thing we know will not work is third parties. Uh, the reason why we don't have a Whig party anymore is because the Republican Party came along in the 1850s. The system itself is designed to only have two parties based on the way elections work, um, based on single member districts with first past the post win. So a third party, even if they were the best third party in the world and they actually did come along and replace one of the parties, which is what happened with the replacement of the Whig Party exactly. by the Republican Party in 1860. Exactly. But even if that comes along, they're still subject to the same incentive structures, the same rotten system that makes the two parties we have not very uh, Is the Progressive Party taking over from the Democratic Party? 
Are they? Is that your question? No, yeah. they are not. That's uh, obvious. I, I, I would say I would say not, but there's certainly strains of ideology in the Democratic Party that are getting an incredible amount of weight in terms of uh, you could call it identity politics that really I think favor towards a poisoning of the well of our political discourse in favor of um, gender fundamentalism, race fundamentalism, sexuality fundamentalism, instead of things that actually unite people like our economic interests, shared economic interests, our shared interests as, as human beings in like a healthy environment where children can grow up and safe. Well, How about the children growing up to be able to function in the adult world? That wouldn't hurt either. Right. So, uh, so we know third parties aren't going to work. We know just better candidates aren't going to work. Yes. And then the, the last thing is where I think every logical person comes to is, well, you need to get money out of politics. Right? You say right? that again? We need to get money out of politics. Um, okay. And you asked about ranked choice voting. There's other cool innovations out there that I do support. I do support ranked choice voting. I do support proportional representation. I, I support term limits, right? Term limits is just a given. Like, that would make things better. But if there's not money out of politics, you still get corruption. Corruption. Like, whoever, the people who are going to win those. How do you get elections? money out of politics? So we know that the only legal recourse way is to change the Supreme Court. And that's not going to happen in a generation. It's, say that again. To change the Supreme Court is the only way that we could get money out of politics because of the Citizens United ruling. Huh. Okay, yeah. So, if you're looking at the way everyone thinks about how you change the system, money out of politics, third parties, or better candidates, and when you know that they're all not going to work, then it leaves us with the question, well, what the hell do we do? And the answer that I am trying to propose, really the purpose of my candidacy, right? Like, I'm, I'm an independent. That doesn't mean I am a fence sitter. Like I take positions on things. It doesn't mean I'm trying to just be the guy that like gets us to hold hands, Republicans and Democrats, because there's nothing special about me. I'm just another candidate. We need to change the tools that would enable the system to work more function, more healthily. And the only way to do that is to acknowledge that the Constitution was set up to prevent the concentration of power. And it does a pretty good job of that in terms of making sure different branches of government don't overpower the others. But it set us up with one check as citizens to balance the government itself. And that's called voting every two to four years. And voting alone, we've tried it over a couple centuries now, voting alone is not enough of a check or balance on this system to course correct what we do. Especially have. if the if the system is corrupt, right. as you have just said, it is. That's the case. Right. So we need to be talking about things other than voting that will allow the citizens to have an influence to course correct the system itself. And what is that solution? So this is where I tend to lose people because um, Solutions are often dry, complicated, boring, and involved. <laughs> you know? So we can talk about what these solutions are. I'm happy to take the conversation there. I'm also happy to just give us a point of pause to say, is there something we want to cover before we dump, jump into that? I'm really happy to jump into it because... Uh, uh, please uh, jump into it. Okay. Right. Should, should we okay. take a vote? Should we jump, jump into it right now? Yeah. I'll try to be brief okay. about it. Uh, how many... Brief. Want us to jump into it right now? Yeah, I'll go for it. Okay. Seems, seems like there's some, some movement in that direction. Um, the people who will control the world in the future are the people who control the strongest, most powerful technology today. And the most powerful technology in terms of group decision making, changing human behavior, is artificial intelligence being employed by big tech or authoritarian nations. And artificial intelligence is the nuclear uh, equivalent of our generation. Like, who controls that will control the world. And we know that it has this feedback loop. It makes you better at whatever you are doing. So authoritarians who have this power become better authoritarians. And if free and open societies don't harness that power to be 
better free and open societies, to be able to tilt the scales back in towards the favor of an authoritarian who uh, decides the course of action. They have no friction in their decision making. From, from intention to action, there's very little friction. They can do that. And so if we are burdened with an incredibly dysfunctional squabbling of you know, trying to herd cats before free and open societies can compete, then the future is going to belong to either authoritarians or to the big tech oligarch, social media firms that control this technology and they're unaccountable to the people as well. So the, what we do other than voting is a couple things. So I'll, ta I'll talk first about the most plain, um, least controversial, simplest step in this direction, which would be imagine if every candidate and every elected official wrote out specifically their policy position, they mapped out where they were on every issue that was asked of them. And then they get to office and it's visible to the entire country. Like it's mapped out in a really user-friendly way where you see where is there actually agreement so that it's not horse trading for all of their votes, you know, it's like, well, I actually agree with you here, but I don't agree with you, so I'm not, I'm going to withhold actually making progress even where we agree. We don't, as citizens, even know where there is strong alignment um, and, and a middle ground because it's not actually mapped out there, right? So this technology could be used to aggregate that information and quickly, rapidly put it to the representatives to say, well, you know, 50% of you agree on, let's, say, let's just say abortion, you know, there's 10% on either side that are, I will, no abortion no matter what. And abortion's free reign, and there actually is 60% of people that agree somewhere around the, the ballpark of late term abortions I'm not okay with, and uh, leave it to the states after that. Or like some, some, you know, like we could visibly see where is there actually meeting grounds? And you could actually trigger and force, I'll get to you in just one second, um, required action where there is agreement. We don't even know where there is that. That's, that is an easy thing to do with technology, to just visibly show us where there is <coughs> agreement. Uh, the reason I don't accept this as a solution to anything is that uh, if you look at the polls, you see constantly that the ability of the billionaires who own the media and who basically control the direction in the social sciences in each of the fields, economics, sociology, political science, and so forth and so on, the billionaires who basically fund the careers in these fields and who also fund the careers of the winning politicians and fund them to victory and fund and refuse to fund the others and consequently they lose, they don't win office. The billionaires who control th these things, in, they cl including control public opinion, they can sway public opinion massively, enormously. You are assuming a public opinion that is something which is fixed. It's fixed by the money. It is shaped by the money, and the money will move it this way or that, depending on how the, the wealth of the top 0.0003% of the wealth holders want it to move. So I, I, I'm not arguing with you that this is a perfect, I'm just trying to plant the seed of what would the simplest one? The simplest I'm saying that it, it's irrelevant what you're talking about. Well, it's not, it's not irrelevant, Eric, to just point out that there probably are already some areas of common ground that are getting overlooked. But common our... ground is not necessarily what would be, quote unquote, common ground if the billionaires wanted it to be different than it is. Sure. Uh, sure. So in other words, get you basically one has to destroy the billionaire class in terms of its, its ability to participate in the electoral system. Well, that's not going to happen. I think there's some very low-hanging fruit that you touch on pretty immediately around reproductive rights, where most most people have some strong opinion on it 
there's measurable outcomes that we can we can look at same with like climate change where this is not a millionaires and billionaires bernie sanders you know somebody's mad at somebody fast but okay. like there's ways that like there's wedge issues here that are being dominated by the fringiest 20 percent of the electorate because they're the most passionate in primaries but where most normal people can come up with a solution if brought together you know like if there is something that says publicly here's where here's where we need to be here's their stance here's the here's i think this is what you're proposing but like there's a there's a common ground that can be reached for us to try to put this dumb fundraising wedge issue to bed right at least for a while and it may evolve and there's always going to be special interests and there always has been in human society but keeping but, the special interests out of politics is a an achievable goal it is an achievable i'm not saying necessarily in this society i'm saying it is possible to create a society to imagine a society in which the wealthiest individuals are basically excluded entirely from from the i mean the if, if we're talking about ideals my ideal wouldn't be you're excluded it would be the only fund funding of elections was every every citizen billionaire or homeless person was given a thousand election bucks so that people who could uh, so it would radically level the playing fields and but if you can't but if the billionaires around, control the news media then it's useless not necessarily useless right if the only people that can pay for advertising on the news media are the election bucks that have radically equalized. And I mean, I'm not saying it's a perfect solution, but it's certainly a step in Liam, the direction, but we're not talking about ideas. Liam, do you read the Washington Post? No, I don't waste my time. Oh, okay. Yeah. The thing is, it is 100% neoconservative. 100%. The left wing and the right wing columnists and the news report. I agree. Yeah. Okay. It's owned by the nation's top uh, controller of, basically seller of web services to the federal government, namely the Defense Department and the CIA and the intelligence community. That's where he makes his money from, not from Amazon, but from Amazon Web Services. That's where the profit at Amazon comes from. It comes from the federal government. And he's so small a defense contractor relative to the others that he doesn't even rank among the top 100. That is one person, he happens to be maybe the wealthiest in the country, maybe the second wealthiest after Elon Musk, who loves coups. Who are you, who are you talking about specifically? I'm talking about Jeff Bezos. Okay. Pardon me, the owner of the Washington Post, 100% of the stock of Washington Post. So, so if I could just interject that, I agree a oligarch-controlled media is a problem. No, it's the problem. No, it's not the problem. One of the problems. It's one of the problems. And one, one of the main problems we're having today. And what problem is 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 is, is, is bigger than that? Apathy. Correct. Apathy is the biggest problem we're running into. If a person doesn't vote, then they don't count. But I'm talking That's about the, people who do count. I'm people. talking about the people who are fed up and don't want to do it, and they become apathetic, and they have uh, yielded to the fringes. Uh, both on the Republican and the Democratic side, the fringes. They're not dominated. a problem for it. They're not the problem. They are the result of the problem. Uh, I beg your pardon. I beg your pardon. It has to do. Uh, now I'm you the blame the, the, the. No, I blame the parents. I'm a psychiatrist. I've worked with uh, children. My specialty is teenagers and self destructive teenagers. I've written books on it, and I'm an expert on that. Yeah, but. but and uh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Don't interrupt. I'm not challenging until you we, on that. Until we yeah. start teaching our children the importance of something other than their cell phones and their toys and their computers, and we start having more face-to-face -face interaction rather than That's watching... That's not a political statement. It is, it's, it's huge. Who votes? People vote. To say you, it's not a political statement. You are blaming human nature. Sir, you are blaming human nature. I, co um, I come from an age where we were raised very differently, I'm sorry, where the human nature was very, very different, where we were raised to be involved. We weren't Republicans or Democrats, we were Americans. 
who happened to be a Democrat or a Republican. Now you're a Republican and a Democrat, and they sort of lose sight of the fact they're Americans. And this is one of the biggest concerns. Well, I'd like to just <coughs> zoom out a little bit to just take a, a further step that might inform uh, Eric. some of your concerns, Eric, which is even, even withstanding your point that it is a large problem that we have, both of you I acknowledge, apathy on the one hand and a oligarch-controlled media on the other. Another okay. application of this idea of creating ways for voters uh, ways for the citizens to in engage with policy uh, outside of just voting is to understand that Princeton University did a study in 2015 showing that there is a 0% correlation between... Mm -hmm. Gillington Page. Thank you for that. Uh, uh, so Gillington Page, what? classic study, 2014. What about it? So it showed that there's a 0% correlation between if the majority of the population prefers a certain policy and if the... If it becomes an active like, law. Correct. In other words, basically, that the only people who actually have an impact on American legislation are the very wealthiest, uh, tiny percentage. And the way they were able to define wealth, since the statistics on that are very problematic to do, is they also use not only uh, household income, but also uh, network analysis of uh, friends and associates. So that, you know, because the, the very wealthiest people, the billionaires, for example, have enormous involvement in networked power. Yes. Okay, well, and so but that's what has, controls this country. But that's we, what they found. But why, do you, why, are, why are the children raised to listen? Uh, we had a very in interesting experience in Germany. I don't even think uh, that well, Excuse me, I'm speaking. Yes. Don't interrupt it. It's a habit you have which is not pleasant. Uh, we had an interesting experience in Germany. Uh, we were waiting at a red light, and we're New Yorkers, and we don't wait at red lights if there are no traffic coming. So all the Germans were standing behind Is that us. how I picked up that habit, just from being from New York? <laughs> you, in New York, if it says, don't walk and there are no cars, you run. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it means. That's right. At uh, my age, it means hobble. But uh, the, the Sally and I started across the street against the light, and first there was a lot of rumbling from the Germans, and then they all followed us. It's <laughs> true. What year was that? Oh, 19, what, seven, uh, was it, you would bought the Porsche in 1969, I think, so, no, 70. I think the things are changed. 70. Uh, but that human nature, uh, if you don't raise your children to think, then they become followers. And uh, the, you're absolutely right about the money. I am not arguing with you about that, but you're limiting it to one thing, and one thing I'll tell you is a shrink, and that is that very often there's more than one causative factor. Most often there's more than one causative factor to situations. And to limit thinking towards this in one causative factor is eliminating all the other causes that play a role. Sure, the oligarchs are there, but then again, who listens? You know, that's the important thing. Does anybody in this room listen to the oligarchs? I think, I think we're getting at the archetypal struggle between left and right, which is right, in my opinion, what I respect about it, the steel man version of conservatism is personal responsibility. The individuals, strong individuals create strong communities. And then the archetypal steel man version of progressivism on the left is healthy communities help create strong individuals. Right? They're reciprocal. And like you're saying, it's, it's multi-causative. Multi-causative, it has to be. Right. And it's, yeah, it's, not, it's not one or the other. And that's, that's what I, I honor. When I say I'm an independent, it's not a tactic. Right? I'm not trying to get one over and sit on the fence. Like, I truly honor that both of those viewpoints play an enormous role in the outcomes we have as a society. The choices of individuals, which like I said, it's not just the candidates, but it is, you know, you still need good candidates. You still need, you know, effective leaders that are, like, I said there's nothing special about me, but I have demonstrated at least to myself that I will do what is unpopular or hard yes, when I believe it is absolutely upholding a sacred value. Like, finding candidates that do that is a good thing, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I'd like to speak about your coming forth in the state of Vermont. You have shocked a lot of people. 
a lot of people who are now seriously looking at you because you are a new voice coming forth. I have been beating at this for four elections as an independent candidate, and you are the brightest thing I've seen for sure. in those you know, four elections. <laughs> no, this is very serious what you're doing, and I hope that you're able to be seen by more folks in the next less than 20 days. God, yes. And that, people, and that people hold off from voting until they really understand what's going on. This is a big problem. I'm running for the Addison Senate as the only independent, and term limits is a serious issue. And the reason why is because we have 40,000 people, and within their lifetime, they have an opportunity to be an elected official. But when you have term limits, you block out a generation of people willing to even participate in a democracy mm -hmm. as you talk. Don't so basically, I'm 67. It, will I be running again? I think there's a point in anyone's life that they need to retire. Will you let me know when? I'm 84. I'm still working. <laughs> uh, I am so happy you're here. I wish there was the opportunity to have more people here, but we do have community television, mm -hmm. and anyone outside of this area can request this footage and be able to oh. share it with friends. But the, this is very nice theoretically. How are we going to get you elected? <laughs> Let's get down to the pragmatic Good. here of getting mm -hmm. Liam elected. Um, I, I just want to finish one thought, which was, I think, actually tying together this idea of we can change the system, but you ultimately do need educated people that are able to withstand and navigate propaganda environments, right? And the most powerful tool on the planet to do that is being used right now already to addict an entire generation to the product of social media. The reason why it's so addictive is because they have a trillion dollar supercomputer trying to predict your behavior and what's going to addict you to their product. And that same technology, it's being used to create a tremendous polarization, tremendous echo chambers, and it's really that the technology is there to be used in the opposite direction if we can be wise enough to realize that that is an incredible opportunity. And that is what... How can we use that opportunity? Right. The billionaires control it. Exactly. Right. You, you, so you, what can we do against it? You need to, just okay. as... I know, I know there's plenty of people in this room that will probably care less about Bernie Sanders and Medicare for All or Andrew Yang and the universal basic income both of which I have critiques of those policies. However, what those candidates did was open the Overton window of what was an important subject for public discussion. So that's step one of a candidacy, right? Like I don't have any naive notion that I'm gonna go there and like, they're gonna roll out the red carpet for, you know, but like it, you need to first of all have one voice of sanity is better than zero, but also, it opens the opportunity to, to start to influence the public with the credibility of, of an office holder. There's, there's only you one argument against the uh, olig oligarchical po uh, power and nothing to be done about it. It took place in 1793 at the Bastille when they threw over all the wealth, all the power, and the people rose. So there are ways, and the history will show us that many times that people have risen up from the ranks, and from uh, how about 1917 in Russia? Uh, yes. We do have these issues that uh, in history would show that if you get enough people uh, who are dedicated, not apathetic, and are very well aware of the danger of the wealthy oligarchs, uh, things can change. American we may not approve, is a great of, example. We may not approve of 1917, but most of us approved of uh, 1793. A little difference here, I think, it's just going to be a rise up from the left, right? From the, the right, it's going to be pretty powerful. I think we're going to have a civil war in this country before the left will I agree. Going. You're not the only one I think one there's going to be a real civil war. Yes. Really bloody. But it won't be north and south. No, no, no. no. It'll be right. It'll be this right wing. It'll be fish, so it'll fish. Be, you know, it'll be, it'll only, be crazy. Only one of us in this room has directly experienced a civil war, which we helped start. And it's certainly something to avoid here. <laughs> what I would say, Iraq. Uh, and That's the not a civil war. 
it, the sectarian I, violence after the Ba'athists were removed. I, from I would I would say it's almost indistinguishable from the Civil War. No, we caused. But anyway, right. yeah, I think that's I was it was an invasion by the United States of government. Course, of course. Of course. But the point yeah. I was going to make is, once it happens, it's it's not something anybody should be calling for, and it's something really? that we should all be desperately scared of. Really sure. And but that was there not was that, 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 that was not brought by the people. Eric, if you can speak. Oh, okay. Eric, could we yeah, please so, just okay. turn down on how much we talk over other okay. people? Please? Thank you. Yeah. What practical tools can an elected official, understanding that that is the worst outcome, and what worries me is how often we talk about it in groups like this or in normal conversations at this point. The idea of a civil war is a terrifying thing, um, to, especially when you have young kids. And what can our elected officials do in a practical manner to de-escalate some of the tensions. I want to turn this back to social media and regulation of artificial intelligence. Is there a sub-caucus that you could see in the House of Representatives that could open the Pandora's box of tech regulation? Like, how do we see the algorithms? How do we make sure that these are not being used to inflame everyone to the point where people are dying? Mm -hmm. Thank you for yeah. that. I think that's very well put. I will be very upfront. I'm not a computer scientist, and like, I, I just recognize the importance of the subject matter, not necessarily the details of the solution, but the idea of having at least dedicated oversight of the subject and trying to, rec you know, and I, I have all sorts of other ideas about how to employ expert opinion over just generalist opinion, as I would be, all Congress people are just generalists. Um, I think it's a, it's, it's a, easy, low-hanging fruit of, of course, that's a great idea. The caveat I want to add on top of that is the idea of, you call it a Pandora <coughs> box, because clearly a, a government that just sees regulation as an opportunity to censor, and not, not as an opportunity to be transparently trying to, as I said, point the technology in the opposite direction, that's what makes it the Pandora's box, right? Um, I mean, do you see grounds there? Like, I'm not saying to regulate. I don't like regulating anything. So much. Right. Is there ways to where those algorithms so, yes. are like a public utility? Yes, I would. I would agree. Um, so that's where I was. I kind of stumbled trying to get to. Yeah. One way is to think of it as we need to regulate the algorithms, which I'm, I'm kind of open-minded to, as long as the public knows what transparently they're intended to do and how they function, I'm, I'm open to that. But another way of, of handling the issue is to understand the reason that these big tech tools are doing what they're doing is because it's actually, it's a, it's a side effect. They're not trying to make society awful and polarized. What they're trying to do is addict people to their product. And that's because the business model is advertising. The longer people stay on your site, the more advertising money you get. So what gets people to stay on your site? Being addicted to it. What gets them addicted to it? Outrage, vitriol, threats. So one possible way of looking at it is not just for regulating and making transparent the algorithms, but another is just to say, let's try a different business model because we see what the effects of advertising as the incentive structure. So how are we going to get you elected? Okay, fair enough. I'm yeah. getting back to that because sure. uh, I left the Libertarian Party in Nassau County when we were talking more about the angels on the head of a pin than how to get people elected. Mm -hmm. And the function of our group here is to get you elected, not discuss all the theoretical aspects of the problem with this country because if mm. we start doing that, uh, we'll all move to Switzerland. <laughs> Well, we need to do a little bit of both, I would say. I think we, you know, we want to we want to come here and, and kind of share ideas as well as, yeah, do it. Do well, that's fine things. after you get elected. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but we have that, three sorry. weeks. I just have another thought, and this is as a mother, a grandmother, and a woman watching what happens to children with what you were describing. The addiction to the the screen. Yes. Yeah. Our grandchildren were in third grade or fourth grade, and some kind parent gave the whole class technology. Mm. 
you know, the bones and everything. Well, that was it. <laughs> that was the most important thing in all of the kids' minds. And eventually what happens is they get very lazy. Then got lazy. Got you know what? You don't look up things and try to discover what something is. You go to Google or you go to this, you go to that thing. Why don't you go to any library and just flip open books at any level and try to figure out what something is? Effort no, they effort. don't. And guess what else happens socially? Our grandchildren, who are teenagers, one's ready to go to college and the other one just went into high school, they'd rather be in their room alone. Why? Because their technology not only tells their friends they can call them quietly, but they also have devices that find out where their other friends are and who they're with and where they are and when they're going somewhere else. That's wild. And they'd rather do that than hang out and be together. And that is awful. Yeah. I mean, it's a that lazy mind every, everybody and it's also non-communicative, which means that all your advertisers and all your, all your, anything that you put in anywhere else, they're up for grabs. You know, in China they have this problem too, and they, they don't let. It's a uh, terrible thing. They don't let their young people. Can you imagine like just that? sitting well, they're in? They're trying in certain countries. Yeah, they realize how bad it is. Um, so so talk know, about getting you elected. Sure. Uh, um, the Second Amendment. How it relates to Vermonters. Talking about. Who what needs to vote for me, right? The, the Republicans, most of them are probably going to vote for me, right? I, I, I want to say I need to have a, a yeah, go on. Yeah. We have a state government that represents the people of Vermont. What do we need? Do we need to be able to let our Vermont citizenship go through a program like a driver's license to be able to hold possession of a weapon that is there for our protection in this world. If we're going to still play on the level field of violence as a solution, is that what we need to do and how does that relate to the Second Amendment? I think we have to remember that the Second Amendment was put in not to protect you from me, but to protect us from the government. Well, that's, that's what and I'm I, talking that's, about. That's, <laughs> Liam, I'll tell you this. Uh, when I speak to people, and convert them from where this stands to you. Two issues, guns, a strong Second Amendment, I'll vote for immediately. Education, abortion, so-so. Uh, when I talk to them about abortion, uh, they're for it, they're against it. Uh, some are for full-term abortion, uh, you know, late-term abortion, which is, as a physician, I'll tell you, is immoral. Uh, but that's not the big issue. The two biggest issues are the kids' education, where they're being indoctrinated by this woke thing which is not preparing them to become adults, and the Second Amendment. And if I say you're a strong Second Amendment, every man I speak to... Sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Just put it on the uh, uh, floor. I'm going to turn it off forever. I, I wonder. I wonder if, if I'm your, so your sorry. sample Thank you. is <laughs> is a selected yeah, because <clears throat> I know I know that where I stand on the Second Amendment is preferable to Republicans already, right? And emphasizing that doesn't gain me votes from where I need it to come from, right? There's two hundred thousand voters. Who are de registered Democrats in Vermont are not registered, but you know vote Democratic consistently. There's ninety thousand that are Republican, and there's a good, you know, up to a hundred thousand that are kind of swing voterish in the middle. So I'm confident I'm, I've said what I need to say about the Second Amendment, and I or I don't really need to. I don't gain much by emphasizing that. No, but that's what they hear. The minute the minute I bring that up, and it's not a skewed sample. Uh, I don't know whether, it, maybe it is, I speak to them at RPM Motors, I speak to them at, uh, at Champlain Bridge Marina, I speak to them at... Uh, uh, not in Burlington. <laughs> no, no, not in Burlington. 
It's uh, a different crowd, right? But I'm told, I'm, I speak to them at uh, the audiologist up in Virgins, who uh, comes from Long Island, and he's in favor. It's not mm -hmm. that skewed a sample. Sally, can you do me a favor? I Put need the phone you on the floor me. and stamp on it with your hand. I Hard. Can somebody help me? Excuse me, I'll turn it off for you. Can you uh, Where is it? Uh, so so I, have, I have one more debate left, and everything else is ground game. Right. Everything else is either actually advertising, um, and I have a pretty meager budget for that, a couple of thousand dollars, compared to tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars. So I can do some advertising, and the question is on what issue? What issue actually generates the most education support? might be. Yeah. And, uh, what, 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 like, thoughts? You haven't spoken in a, in a while, Tom. Do you have any thoughts about what issue actually is, is it education? Um, <coughs> I think what... Uh, so I, I just sort of trying to make a decision are used to looking for is I have a lot of a candidate to answer so your answer to yeah. the yeah. question thank you it'll um, stop <clears throat> aside from what you're going to do and say in Washington Vermont's got the one vote out of 435 they're wondering how you would use that one vote to represent Vermont um, so, you know, what committee you'd want to serve on, what bill you'd hope to sign, um, that sort of thing. I know there are people out there like that. It's yeah. just so, so hard for me to relate to because yeah. I'm wondering in this room how important that is for, for you folks. Because I think, you know, like, I'm just like, well, I care if someone is going to fund the war machine, if they're going to help have the best educated kids in the world and not, you know, middling mediocrity, are we gonna have better health care? Like to know what committee the congressman stands on is very secondary to me. And I know those people exist. I'm just saying it's foreign for me to think of it that way. But I think I Tom brings up a very good point, and that is uh, how are you going to vote in Congress uh, for the Vermonters? And I think that I, I think that the main point and I think it's are you guys suggesting saying like having a kind of generic overall like hey I'm gonna vote in this kind of marketing buzzword kind of way is what people want to hear? Uh, if it goes along with your thinking, if it doesn't go along with your thinking, then you're just gonna become a politician. Okay. Uh, I've been able to hand out. I get the most positive response with the simplest messaging. For you, like my dad is a prime example of a guy who used to be a Republican. He's everybody now, but <laughs> sorry. Um, but like, you know, what does Liam Madden stand for? And I'm like, he thinks the two-party system is broken uh, and needs a change. I just stop there and they're like, I'll take a sign. <laughs> they hate both parties so much that they're like, <laughs> put anybody who is rationally sane up there. And there's a, enough of those people that that those are the people that I'm getting reactions, mm -hmm. good reactions from people who are like, no, I don't want to talk about politics, don't bring up the candidate, to, oh, okay, he's not one of them. All right, I'll think about it. But how do you energize those people? We have a week those and a half. Too, right? Do you have like flyers and stuff that I can hand out that are printed well? Yeah. Uh, either yeah. we're yeah. off yeah. either yeah. I can yeah. do it. So going like back door to door, I can do that I got in a week and a half. But going back to what you're referring to, is, and I was talking about the Second Amendment, Republicans and Democrats in, within the two-party system, all Americans want to relate to the Second Amendment. How do we work with it to do what its job was meant to be? And, and that is something that needs to be related from a Vermonter if you are elected to Washington. I mean, I have no problem. How are you states. going to make it work in the state of Vermont? I mean, to be honest with you, that's a, that's a distinction that like, my federal activity isn't actually regulating. You know, like the Becca Ballant or her successor in the state house makes laws that regulate Vermont, right? Ah, uh, but it's how you communicate to the state. It's how the state is communicating outward. Two, how do we solve not only Vermont's issues but America's issues? 
you're, you're taking a big step forward here. And that's what Vermonters want to feel that they're sending to Washington. It's a person who can put it out there and get that two-party system to sit there with their jaws dropped open going, okay. Well, I, I'm, I'm hearing room for marrying these ideas that if there's the, the most enthusiasm from people who are typically the people who are least engaged in politics, how do you massage that kind of tension, that paradox to actually upswell the vote? I, I have a question. Where were all the women? Sally's the only woman in this room. Where are the others? It's an important question. We uh, are on like 100 people. I have a question. As a can we just, we'll, we'll take you right after. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. If I'm in, in the race, there's two people that you know s support gun rights and, and one that doesn't. Um, so I don't think that issue is going to give you your winning margin. Right. Um, I think what's on people's mind is um, inflation, the economy, price of gas. Um, do you have anything to say about that? Do you think that, that do you have anything to say about that that you think would um, sway votes your way? Well, I'm o I'm open to learning more in this room, but I honestly, <coughs> when I hear Rebecca Ballant's answers <coughs> compared to mine, I don't see an incredible amount of contrast. I think th there's a short-term thing that you can do, which is remove some of the currency that's causing inflation through taxing the the richest, right? Or you can um, think about the long-term root cause issues, which are really about supply constrictions that you can only address through re-regionalized re supply chains. Uh, you know, say what you want about Beck Ballin, that's, that's a reasonable approach, and that's kind of how I see it too, but I'm also, like, I'm not, a, it's a super complex issue. If there's other ways that make sense that I can make a strong point with, happy to do that. Those things sound like they take a long time. Right. We'd have inflation for quite a while by right. the time we got this to the solution there. Yeah, but I don't know the issue well enough, I guess, to, to say what would be an instant fix to inflation. I don't really honestly know that there is one. There isn't. Yeah. yeah. Tremendous well, then, economic then, pain. Then I wouldn't recommend that you use your $2,000 of campaign funds to um, get the uh, voters uh, to like you best by election day um, on an issue, mm -hmm. um, I think. Right. I think if if it's not going to be the issue that's on people's minds, then your strong point is, um, I'm smarter, that's it. which you can't say. And <laughs> but, but, I mean, you can't. That's too blatant. But but basically, I'm I'm smarter, and um, I would be refreshingly different and think. Uh, for myself, original. I think it's that original thoughts. Right. So, so in other words, run as you, as as your message. I don't know how to put that, but run as you as your message, so that um, uh, it it sort of distracts people from whatever issue they're bringing to to their decision. I agree with that. That's. <laughs> I think that there is so much disagreement here on the issues, frankly, that it comes down to whether someone trusts that you will not be like all the others are. Yeah, yeah, okay. That, that, I mean, this is helpful. I mean, you guys came to a room and it, it has an impact on the way I'm moving forward, for sure. And I guess if, if it probably could if you go out and talk to people if you'd like to do that. That seems to be the message, right? Like that, that's, you, you can't really peg it to one particular issue. You really are the message. The, the biggest differentiator is mm -hmm. kind of group think the system as it is, just tinker with it versus... Be open-minded to radical change. And just independent thought and, and seeing the yeah. merits of multiple perspectives. The thing 
that amazes me is what everyone said, your mind and your openness and your ability to think and reason and work out things in an intelligent, understanding way is, is what people who have open minds are amazed. They are all amazed. The only thing that really shocks me is people who think of the parties like a club and they're terrified that other people wouldn't like them if they weren't in their club, Democrat or Republican, you know. And, and those people I don't understand at all because there's all kinds of changes in life and in the universe. And if you don't have open minds and watch and listen and try to understand and work with it, then you're a lost soul. And why people can't open their minds and, and, and work with it. I mean, that is such an elementary thing. And it's just like at school when the kids were at school and kids had their parents write the paper and they bought their papers and they got the nut and all the answers to exams so that they could have A's. One kid in college, she was a wonderful kid and bright and everything, but she said, I have nothing to worry about. I get all my papers paid for. I know all the exams, and not only that, but when I get out of college, I have a, a already a, a work and high pay and everything. You know, Sally brings up but you know thing. what? That's lousy. But that shows the mentality. Because, because they didn't do anything to deserve it, and it all shows. When they go to work and they say, do this and that, oh, well, uh, hmm. yeah. <laughs> and when they get involved, they don't, because they didn't need to. And their parents did everything for them, and they are just nobody and nothing. And I don't care how much money they have. I went to a prep school. I knew all these wealthy people, and they were duds because all they were going to do is go sit yeah, in their well, father's yeah. office. Know, that's a different group. <laughs> so but you know, I'm trying to say, real people think. Uh, uh, real people want to discuss when there are problems. Leo. And they are coming up always, and Liam. we're lucky to have you. <laughs> Liam, two things. Yes. Look at this room. Only John here does not have gray hair. <laughs> Sally here is the only one who's not male. <laughs> yeah. The demographics are very interesting. And why, why is that? Short answer, I don't know. Uh, Apathy. Well, also lack of resources, right? No. I think it's also I think it's also like time commitments. I have two children. I don't have any time to campaign. I don't have any time to show up at meetings. I mean, this meeting's demographics don't look any different than the Republican meeting demographics. Uh, but John, recently. if you have two children, you've got a campaign. Which is why. I'm, that, which is why. I'm sure. But it's very difficult. Yeah, yeah, it is, John. And as a parent myself, with two adult children, I have to keep fighting. Yes. I would. I, I'm, I'm conscious of the fact that we're coming up on kind of the end of our time here in this mm -hmm. room. Um, what are you saying? I mean, I, I think we've shared with you what resonates with us, but I mean, I think Paul Dame said something interesting when you first won um, the Republican nomination, where he was kind of like, let's see if something resonates. I, you know, I'm paraphrasing him, but. What are you seeing that around the state that is resonating within your message? You know, obviously there's pep. This is a very diverse group of people's beliefs in this room. Um, so what are you seeing as resonating around the state? Uh, I'd say some, something similar when people hear that I'm not just on a side and that there's some genuine caring for multiple perspectives and also strong critique for the bullshit process that is getting us nowhere. Um, that, but I, I also see where I get the most resistance, where there's the most walls and, and you know, banging your head against the wall is people just don't listen 
at all. They see a, an R means Republican. You must be X, Y, and Z. You know nothing about the story. It doesn't matter what I say. That's why none of, none of my friends are here. <laughs> you know, they're and you dead. asked why are the demographics? It's because you're a Democrat. I mean, well, my, friend, my friends are. I'm, you're French. Yeah. Um, the demographics, the disproportionate amount of women and young people <laughs> tend to be Democrats. So there's a lot of Democrats not in this room because they're once upon a time the more open-minded party, allegedly. And I think that's changed. <laughs> uh, I've converted quite a few Democrats. Mm -hmm who are fed up with the Democratic Party. I have been a Democrat. I've been a registered Democrat since, just likely after Harry Truman. Mm -hmm. That goes back a while. And I've uh, been working for the Democratic Party since Harry Truman. Well, you took a detour there into the Libertarian Party of Long. I did County. a long time ago, <laughs> but the Democrats have betrayed the Democrats. The, huh. the Democratic Party has totally betrayed the Truman Democrats. <coughs> and uh, I think that I have converted Democrats to vote for you mm -hmm. by pointing out, yes, you're strong. Vermont is like that Second Amendment, they do. But that you are pro-choice, that you are, uh, that gay marriage is okay in your mind, and that you don't like the way the education system is being run today. Mm -hmm. I mentioned those three things, and it overcomes the Republican uh, title statement. statement, and I think that that's a, talk about pragmatism. This is the thing that has really converted uh, five or six Democrats in my area. They're all Democrats. They're all uh, expats coming from New York and Massachusetts, and now all of them have signs out in front of the House saying "Madden for Congress." Uh, so I I, I want to also say we're, we're going to be wrapping up here in the next five minutes. Also curious. Just, just for shits and giggles, we wanted to go do a little sign wave because why not? not? Um, cool. Um, but just from conversations I've had today, I do feel influenced in how I go forward in terms of I do need to be a lot more explicit. I, I thought I was. Uh, Pro-choice is something so many people c care about. I put too much nuance into it. I need to be a little bit more direct that um, that's my stance, and also that it's really not about any really other other issue other than can we examine how fucked up, dysfunctional this system is, and think about how. But th that's general. They, they need specifics. You, you, you do need both, specifics. but I mean, if I if I had to have a general theme that helps people realize that there's a different animal, right? So let's just, well, you guys will close this out, okay? I was raised totally opposite from Donald. I'm from Massachusetts. I was born in Boston. You did not talk about religion. You did not talk about politics. You didn't talk about sex. You didn't talk about anything but nice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and this is the way I was. And when I first went out with Donald, I came home to my roommate <coughs> for college crying my head off. And she said, what the heck's the matter with you? He doesn't respect Sally, me. No. <laughs> she said, what? Well, he let somebody tell a dirty joke. No, so oh, he doesn't respect me. She said, I, give me a break. You know, that's a mentality. So, okay, but that is a mentality. That is. Don't do say that. anything ever about anything. anything. And so my <laughs> brothers my and I state. went to the girls. We were curious about religion. We were cur curious about cultures. We were curious about everything, everything. And we just never stopped. Yeah, but how, that, that's the word, one word there that is lacking in the youth of today, curiosity. It is a very dangerous What's the word? curiosity. I'm, I am wary of generalizations. Um, mm. So can you close this out, please? The thing that really disturbed me the other day is that WCAX, I think it is, they had this debate that you participated in. It's the last debate. I, well, was it WPTC? I think it was WCAX. It was, that was two days ago. Pardon me? WCAX was two days ago. Yeah, okay. 
uh, it was just WCAX. Can you well, move that a little bit? We can hear each other. Oh, okay. The WCAX debate. If you look at it online, they have a three-minute highlights, and then they have the thirty was it the fifty-nine minute debate. In the three minutes highlights, the announcer at the front simply summarized that Liam Madden is um, opposed to um, the, uh, the question number five amendment, yeah. adding amendment 22 to uh, um, extend abortion rights in Vermont, whatever. That's it. And I thought to myself, oh my God. And then I looked at what you had said in the actual debate. And I said to myself, should I, you know, because I wanted to find out, did they misrepresent you? And I ended up concluding that they gave the wrong impression of you. For sure. Okay. And that consequently, uh, I, and I would not call their attention to it because the error was on your part for not having made it clear that what you know, that you actually are in favor of choice and that you support strongly the I actually it actually did say my last sentence was if it was about abortion I would support it yes but it was unclear what you were referring to uh, uh, you see because are you saying that yes you would re you would then you would support adding uh, you would support a yes answer on question five you were unfortunately vague on this crucial issue, which really is the one of the two by dividing lines in the general electorate. And if you look at the polls, one of them is the war issue. In other words, uh, shall we shall we stick with Ukraine to the end, even if it means World War Three? And the other is, uh, uh, shall we work toward uh, reversing? The, Supreme, the, cur the current Supreme Court majority, which is now a 63 majority, uh, and doing everything possible to get candidates who will work in that direction. The point is this, uh, uh, and that's a long-term goal, obviously, obviously, because we're talking about that they're a sick, diseased, evil U.S. Supreme Court. I'm sorry, but that's the, uh, the, uh, the, short, uh, uh, the short of the long on that. In any event, uh, 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 that is the thing which really disturbed me regarding that debate. And it's interesting that in the PBS equivalent, which had proceeded, they did a superb job having a three-minute highlights and then the full debate. And the three-minute highlights did not distort you at all. If, and anyone who sees that three-minute highlights excerpt on the PBS debate will vote for you, practically. It was fantastic. It's the best PR for your campaign. It was phenomenal. The PBS debate, Madden versus Ballant. The three-minute highlights which was the whole Which debate, debate was that? VPR. Yeah, but how long ago was that? Oh, that, that was like about a week ago. It was just a few days before the yeah. WCAX debate. I'm talking about stuff that reaches all of our monitors. Mm -hmm. But and it doesn't that, reach all of our monitors because that? not all the candidates are on the stage. No, right, right. I'm talking about in, in <laughs> folks. So we're going we're gonna to grab some signs. Uh, if you could lead, lead us, middle, Middlebury folk, to the, the best corner to... Spend a couple minutes just. Well, there's, one, there's one within walking distance. That sounds traffic, great. The traffic circle. Yeah, do you think the Cannon side would be best as people drive south, or do you think uh, in front of the municipal building? Best. The, go out the screen. From, uh, Middlebury's intersection is 30 and 7. Yeah. Um, <coughs> 30 has plenty of traffic. 7 has even more. Um, so if you're right there, basically under the con the congregational church. Um, there's no higher visibility than right there. Cool. Anybody need any posters? I've got a call over. <laughs> but, yeah. but that's a longer he's, walk. He's all mine got stolen. I put them up outside. Somebody came and took them all there. Anyway, anyone anyway, anyway, to take some off of uh, Anyone who wants flyers, I'll I'll lawn signs. I have a lot of lawn signs. 